Hello again, and welcome back to the Slow Flowers Podcast with Deborah Prinzing, episode 546. This is the weekly podcast about slow flowers and the people who grow and design with them. It's all about making a conscious choice, and I invite you to join the conversation and the creative community as we discuss the vital topics of saving our domestic flower farms and supporting a floral industry that relies on a safe, seasonal, and local supply of flowers and foliage. This show is brought to you by slowflowers.com, the free online directory to more than 880 florists, shops, and studios who design with local, seasonal, and sustainable flowers, and to the farms that grow those blooms. It's the conscious choice for buying and sending flowers. And thank you to our lead sponsor, returning for 2022, Farm Girl Flowers. Farm Girl Flowers delivers iconic burlap wrap bouquets and lush, abundant arrangements to customers across the U.S., supporting U.S. flower farms by purchasing more than $10 million of U.S. grown, fresh and seasonal flowers and foliage annually. Discover more at farmgirlflowers.com. Our next sponsor thanks goes to Johnny's Selected Seeds, an employee-owned company that provides our industry with the best flower, herb, and vegetable seeds supplied to farms large and small, and even backyard cutting gardens like mine. Find the full catalog of flower seeds and bulbs at johnnysseeds.com. Well, February has been a month already packed with flowers from Valentine's Day to our annual spring ritual here in Seattle, the Northwest Flower and Garden Festival. Earlier this month, I hosted a number of -of out-of-town Slow Flowers members who were here to speak and teach at the flower show. And it was so nice to see one another in person and to celebrate locally grown flowers and sustainable practices in both growing and design. My two guests today joined the Blooms and Bubbles workshop series at the flower show produced by Slow Flower Society. Bethany Little of Charles Little & Company, based in Eugene, and Beth Cyphers of Crowley House Farm in Rickreal, which is south of Salem, taught on the first two days. We had so much fun. Bethany led a romantic wreath design class, and Beth taught a flower crown workshop. The students loved it all. I'm so glad that Beth and Bethany had time to sit down and visit with me for a conversation we recorded to share with you today. We recorded at the Seattle Wholesale Growers Market in Seattle, a farmer-owned cooperative that is also a Slow Flower Society sponsor and longtime partner. You'll see the beautiful Northwest potted orchids in the background as the three of us sat down to discuss news from these two Oregon flower farms. Here's a little background about Bethany Little. With her husband, Charles Little, Bethany is co-owner since 1998 of Charles Little & Company in Eugene, Oregon. She has a background in floral design and is the farm's sales and shipping manager, as well as a wreath maker extraordinaire. Charles founded the farm in 1986, establishing it on 35 acres of nutrient-rich soil along the coast fork of the Willamette River. Located at the foot of Mount Pisgah in Eugene, their crops consist of foliage of all kinds, ornamental herbs, grasses and grains, unique sticks, pods, and berries. A sizable part of the farm includes popular annual and perennial flowers, such as larkspur, snapdragons, sunflowers, peonies, calla lilies, lavender, and more. And considerable acreage is devoted to woody shrubs and trees such as viburnum ilex, spirea, wygela, hydrangea, cotinus, lilac, snowberry, cornus, eucalyptus, specialty conifers, ornamental cherries, and almonds. Charles Little and Company relies on the principles of regenerative agriculture. Over the years, plants have become naturalized and now require very little weeding or pest control. All crops produced on the farm are in-season and field-grown without the use of hoop houses or greenhouses. Charles Little and Company's range of unique, high-quality floral materials distinguish them from many other farms. Here's a little background about Beth Cyphers of Crowley House. Beth and her husband Jason have two children, and they live at Crowley House Flower Farm outside McMinnville, Oregon. What started out as just a flower design hobby 10 years ago has grown over time into the family farm of today. 
the need to produce high quality blooms for best floral designs, plus the appeal of the slower, simpler lifestyle for their family, the need to feel the soil on their hands and feet, to see the sun rise and set over their fields. It has led them down the path of flower farming and the amazing adventure that has become Crowley House. Beth is the co-author of the forthcoming book, Furrow and Flower, with her sister, Sarah Kunze, which Bloom Imprint will publish this coming fall. Both Beth and Bethany are past guests of the Slow Flowers podcast, and I'll share links to those conversations from earlier episodes in today's show notes, which you can find at slowflowerspodcast.com for episode 546. Let's jump right in and meet these two established Oregon-based flower growers and designers. Hi, everybody. I am so excited to be here today with two special guests. On your left, you see uh, Beth Cyphers from Crowley House Farm. And on your right, Bethany Little from Charles Little and Company. And uh, I just picked you two up from the airport. You flew in to be at the Northwest Flower and Garden Festival as instructors. Thank you. Oh, it's so good to be here. Thanks for picking us up. That was yes. that was great. And you even picked the right door. I was <laughs> like, we're right here. Yeah. <laughs> well, I couldn't let a chance go by to film a conversation with you. Both of you have been on the podcast in the past. And... Um, We'll be sure to share links of those past episodes, but it's been a while, and um, I just think you're both doing exciting things with your farms, and I wanted to give everyone an introduction, and we'll also hopefully show clips of your your instruction uh, at the show this week. So let's start with you, Beth. Um, Introduce Crowley House, and and let everybody know what you're up to these days. Okay, well, um, I am Beth. I am um, the owner of Crowley House Flower Farm. And um, lately, we have been doing all kinds of things on the farm. As far as new infrastructure going in, I have a new greenhouse that I just put in that is going to house um, mums for the most part. And then we're going to do anemones in the spring, mums in the fall. And it's just going to be designated to pretty much that, as far as I know. (laughs) So, so, So like a... Counter cyclical to seasonal crops that yes. don't conflict and they get their dedicated space. Yes. And well, they're popular. Yeah, they are. We've grown a lot of mums over the years, probably for 10 years. It's been one of my main crops that I do. Uh, but I found that I just can't grow enough of them. So I just decided to bite the bullet, put a new greenhouse in, and that is what we're working on now. So yeah, that greenhouse is going to get paid for fast. It is. I know. <laughs> okay, we, just listening to Bethany egg you on. <laughs> <laughs> this is what happens. <laughs> we get in trouble. So we get each other in trouble. Yeah. So Bethany, give us a little introduction to you, and then we'll we'll have a little sure um, give and give and take here. So um, Charles Little and Company started in 1986. I hope I get that right. Um, Charles started the farm. I married into it. Um, but uh, let's see, right now we are um, just getting this, the farm sort of waking it up and starting to take cuttings. And um, I have been working on a new online dried flower um, sales so that people can order flowers nationwide, which is super exciting. So I have two new employees that that whole part of the business supports. And I'm I don't know. I'm just super proud of it. And it's, I think it's really neat. And I just love being able to supply quality product to people nationwide. And then uh, I've been doing a a weekly live every Sunday. So teaching people like how to, how I touch our product and how I use our product. And just, there's just not enough. I keep telling everybody there's not enough wreath makers for the people who want to buy wreaths out there. So So you're saying that anyone who's watching could start their own wreath collection or wreath line. Yeah, yeah, I really think so. I really think so. And there's so many people who are creative, and it's just so fun to see people's different takes on how they use flowers and or thing natural things around them, and how you know, like I follow a woman who's a weaver and a a dried flower um, artist, and I love just seeing just like this hybrid and explosion yeah. and it's just so fun it is just it's really great to see dried flowers come back into the mainstream again because I never fell out of love with them <laughs> right, right right well um 
we're excited to be used right flowers in both of the projects that you'll be teaching at uh, the Northwest Flower and Garden Festival. And when I had a chance to set up the instructor lineup, I just convinced you both to come and teach from Oregon. So it's a bit of a draw, a travel, you flew, but also uh, to, because you're friends, you kind of are assisting each other. So Bethany, you're going to teach uh, romantic wreaths uh, on Wednesday, and Beth is going to teach flower crowns on Thursday, and you'll be each other's assistants, which I think will be uh, make it a lot more fun because yeah. I get to be with you for two full days. Yeah, no, it's exciting. It is fun. <laughs> it's I haven't been off the farm. I haven't traveled in two years, so this is <laughs> this is my first big. She even step. put a dress on today. <laughs> So um, you both are talking about teaching and education, and I know education is sort of at the heart of your farms. Um, at Crowley House, you've been doing all kinds of channels of teaching, and obviously on-farm education, but because of the pandemic, you kind of went more digital, right? Yeah. my um, Both my husband and son really like doing videos, and we were doing videos for other like our church needed videos done and that kind of thing. So they learned to use these systems that are kind of complex. Yeah. And Jason's like, I really enjoy this. You know, let's start filming a little bit more. So we've really uh, gotten on it. And <laughs> it's a lot of work. It's another full-time job for somebody to do a, you know, YouTube channel. Yeah. And so we're getting our videos up every Sunday, sometimes Mondays, but generally every Sunday, um, just trying to get content out to really show people what flower farming is really like, the nitty gritty, behind the scenes, not so beautiful Instagram kind of things. And just, you know, it's just more of a vlog. So it's just our daily life on the farm. Um, and then we also started our uh, a Blooming Good Time podcast, and that's with Riley and Emma. It's super fun. And then that came about just because I wanted, um, when I first started farming, I was kind of by myself. I had my kids and that kind of thing, family, but I was pretty much by myself in the fields. And I felt like I was really lonely. So mm -hmm. I wanted somebody, like a girlfriend, to be along with me. And that is what that podcast is. It's, it's just a conversation that you can be a part of. You're eavesdropping on. <laughs> yeah. But you're invited to be in that conversation. Um, and we've just gotten so much support worldwide already. It's just crazy. I am feeling so blessed by it. That's crazy. So, so Riley is your daughter. She's in her early 20s, right? Yeah, she's turning 25. Oh, wow. And Emma is your niece, and she's a little bit older than Riley, but they're they're like sisters practically, yes. right? And so they're bringing you, uh, they're bringing flower farming to a younger generation too. So yeah. do they come up with the topics or like do you guys talk about it every, every yeah so week? what's been kind of fun on the farm is just even in the youtube or in the podcast i might suggest something to them but i want them to learn so i'm seeing they did this tulip experiment that they thought through themselves i kind of knew how to do it but i didn't say anything and let them kind of figure it out and then they figured out something went wrong and then figuring out the next step and we we are putting that all out on the youtube and on on um, the podcast so that people can feel like, you know, this is how we've learned. And I already know the end story to it, but <laughs> it's kind of it. fun. I love it that you're kind of, it. you're, you're kind of letting them run with it too. And um, uh, create their own, uh, I guess, philosophy and their own aesthetic and their own kind of storyline that is, like I said, a younger generation, which we want to see happen. Yeah. Well, they watch Monty Don every lunchtime. And then I saw Riley cutting one of our, like, um, I think it was a gooseberry or something like that down. And she's like, but Monty told me to. Because I'm like, what are you doing? <laughs> well, Monty told me to do this. I love it. <laughs> it was pretty fun. Well, um, similarly, Bethany has been doing basically Instagram TV and all kinds of sort of regular uh, installations of a couple projects. One, I have to just give you props for 365 days of <laughs> <I know. laughs> because I was with you when you we were making one and you we were kind of like some days I have to make two to catch up <laughs> <laughs> some days I did so tell us how that how I mean you were already active on Instagram before that but that kind of gave you a a regular following of yeah what is Bethany going to do today I thought it was um it'd be really fun and interesting I really uh our dried flower sales were still really low and I'm just sort of wanted to shake the tree and show people. And one of the things that it, I'll look at, sometimes I'll scroll through all my old images and I'll think, wow, that was a, like, I could watch the whole progression of like the creativity and 
doing it every single day and it making it a practice really, really made my, like, I, my artistry it really yeah. expanded. And now I look at it, I'm like, I need to maybe do that again. Would just make my wreath and then I would take a photo and do a couple videos of it and put it up. And they're all still there in highlights as well. So that's right. kind of fun. If, right. And if, what's the hashtag? Um, that one is a wreath a day. Uh, oh, is that wow. 2019? I think so. And I think it was 19 and 20 because I started... Right. I started because there was a flood, and I was like, I have to look out a window that is not towards the river. <laughs> when did you start feeling more comfortable doing uh, weekly kind of um, yeah I just, stories about, about Charles Little and Company and what you were doing on the farm? I think probably in 20, like mid-21, okay. I started feeling a little bit more comfortable. Um, but I just, I just thought, what's the harm in it? I mean, I... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I remember having that conversation with you. It was like, okay, you know, we need to do this if we're going to, you know, there's always the next and the new. Yeah. And so we both kind of encouraged each other each day or she would take one and t- look at it really fast. Do I need to take it down? Yeah, I would. I <laughs> do would I sound stupid? I'm like, look do I say now? um too much? You know, that kind of thing. So. Well, I think that's great because it is, it is, um, I think the ideas of what you're teaching and talking about are coming to you because people are emailing you or, or posting questions on your Instagram. So you, you kind of mm-hmm. know what, what topics are frustrating people or that yeah. people need more information. Yeah, where's right? the pain point in, in whatever they're doing? And so just showing that in, so, in the story or in, yeah. in the video. Okay, so how do you do that? Uh, Bethany, are you doing that on a, on Sundays, or I can't remember what day? So you do that. I do a Sunday, 10 a.m. Pacific Standard Time, or Pacific Time, um, live, and it's about an hour usually. Mm-hmm. And I'm always doing some kind of wreath, um, or making something, or showing them like here. This I like took them out into my backyard one day, and I was like, "This is how we make the grapevine bases." I remember that. Um, yeah. So. But also there's other pain points, you know, for people in growing. So I try to answer some of those in stories because people will see, you know, a reel about nigella pods or something. And they're like, when do you sew those? Mm -hmm. Or Mm -hmm. um, so I try to answer lots and lots of those kind of like direct sewing questions. Since we do a lot of direct sewing on a lot um, on, you know, for the all those larkspur, like all like a lot of dried flowers, a lot of pods. Um, and it's sort of a funny, a funny sewing schedule when you sew in the fall and the little baby stands out all winter long and mm-hmm. kind of Very blows fun. people's minds. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but Well, you talked about encouraging each other. Um, how did you two meet? And I, you know, you're about, Beth, you're kind of outside of Salem and Bethany's in Eugene. So you're about like 90 minutes away from each other. Is that yeah. right? Okay. Well, it's a funny story. Beth I want to hear it. <laughs> I don't. <laughs> so we started um, a, the the Pacific Northwest Growers Meetup, and I think it was the second year, third year of doing it. And we, Aaron, um, Aaron you and Aaron, not you and me. Yeah, no, you didn't start it. With <laughs> no, we invited them to come. You and Aaron McMullen from Mc, Raindrop. Yes. Okay. Mm-hmm. We invited uh, Charles and Bethany to come and. They showed up, and I remember we were standing on the wall. I was standing with uh, our friend Jen Ladd and a couple of the, the people, and um, we look over, and they show up, and we're like, oh, the celebrities are here. Oh, my God. <laughs> the big-time growers. <laughs> <laughs> and then, so Jason's, like, knew that I, like, had, I, would, I totally had a crush on their farm. <laughs> and so he went over, and he tried to talk to Charles and um, an introvert. Yes, he's an introvert. <laughs> Let's just say that we love him. So anyway, That's why Charles isn't on camera that much. <laughs> <laughs> and so, anyways, he's like, ah. Oh. And I said, okay, I'm gonna try. And so, and I think Bethany was probably just so nervous, knowing her now. Like, <laughs> um, and they, they, you know, this was new. This was yeah. a new group. There was a lot of people and that kind of thing. And so, I remember walking away from that meeting and thinking I'm going to be friends with them I don't care what it takes but I'm going to be friends with them that's neat so I don't know how it blossomed from there but I don't really remember I remember you guys came down to the farm I probably and yeah. visited and we were like I think discussing. we just made another attempt and I think that was that's how it happened well I Beth Beth uh, Bethany has told me that you guys talk or t- text 
generally every day. Like you're just just a little check in, and yeah. Um, so you really are a kind of each other's sounding board for when you're trying to figure out either a growing problem or some kind of marketing problem, right? Yeah, and I think originally I was new in growing, so then it was kind of one of those things where I needed help, and because I was running all these events, every single event, I never got to sit on any of the classes. So I felt like, okay, either I get a book, but it's just so nice to have somebody to be able to chat with, and Bethany and Charles know so much. And now it's kind of like Charles sometimes asks me questions. This is kind of fun. (laughs) That's a huge so, compliment. I know, right? <laughs> it's I love fun. it. Or Bethany does. I ask lots of questions. I mean, mm-hmm. that's the only way to keep going forward is to, I mean, I am so isolated on the farm. I, um, And I'm like, Eugene is like around no other mm-hmm. flower farmers, like maybe one or two other flower farmers that are on any larger scale. Mm-hmm. And so... You know, I have lots of questions, and I want to try things that Charles has absolutely no interest in growing. Like, you know, my ranunculus and anemone. You know, he could throw it in the compost pile as far as he's concerned. But I gave you mums. I know, but now and he that, likes mums. Now he likes <laughs> mums. It's really funny. So it's great. That's um, so cool. And, it's, and and the funny thing is that Charles has got to be really, I'm guessing, really proud of what's happening with the dry flower business, because he was in the first wave in the mm-hmm. 80s when, yeah. when he had a, a national customer base just for dried flowers, right? Yeah, that's why he started the farm. It was just a dried flower farm. That's all it did. Wow. Talk about having to adapt yeah. with the waves of yeah. what's in fashion. Yeah, it makes you feel better, though. When I mean, you, you know somebody like that that has gone through that and you see the farm still be successful and it has these waves that come up and down, and, you know, it can be nerve wracking at times when you're like, hee hee, there's a lot of growers, you know, there's a lot of people wanting to do this. Um, yeah. But then you're just like, ah, you be you, you yeah, grow, that's you keep right. going and you, right. you'll see it. It's just there's, everybody's in their own season yeah. of what they're doing. You know, like every t- like we did a lot of. Like, how are we going to make it? So we were bouquet makers for mm-hmm. grocery stores. Uh, then we were we did farmer's markets. And then we did a lot of national shipping for, um, uh, what do you call them, companies that... Like I'm oh, doing drop, now. Like drop ship? Drop ship, yeah. you know, yeah. for people who just actually were in tele- making, you know, making sales and packing those orders. And finally getting to where we wanted to be. Like, what makes us happy farming right now? And... Mm-hmm. So it's really fun to see people in their season of being a farmer who makes uh, bouquets, does farmer's markets, and or maybe someone that just does um, weddings and events. And being like, I was there. I was great. I don't want to do that anymore. And it's so wonderful that someone else is yeah, doing it. There's room for someone yeah. else to take oh, yeah. that. And then we're, we're here to have conversations about, like, What's the most appropriate way to do it? Um, how do you like? How do you keep that from spilling in your car? And <laughs> the really stupid questions that are like the like we already went around. So let's talk to each other. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Well, I think it's interesting from what I understand about the dried flower national shipping program is you you mainly is it correct to say you mainly sell through wholesalers? But the dried flowers is something that you can do direct fulfillment in. Like, you've, you've worked that out? Yep. So nobody's look, looking side-eyed at you and wondering I, that? No one, as far as I know, is looking side-eyed at us. You know, I like, all my wholesalers um, in Fresh and all my wholesalers that are just dried flower wholesalers know what we're up to. It's I don't think that we're um, spoiling any part of the market. Yeah. Um, and you're probably selling a lot to to consumers, not uh, florists, or are you doing both? Actually, my largest um, market is farmers, other farmers. Okay. And I think it's because, <laughs> yeah, Beth comes and shops a lot. Yeah, that's a, she has an exclusive deal. <laughs> um, but I just go to see her. <laughs> uh, there's farmer, you know, and then there's, there's florists, like in New York City. Mm-hmm. Um, I have a couple, um, like Brooklyn and New York, but... Because I don't, none of my wholesalers in New York will buy my dried flowers. I don't know why. So, so the, <laughs> so the florist co- does. The florist finds you then. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah, and it's it's great. You know, I'm I'm really really happy with with who we're selling to. Yeah. 
I think it's cool that you're both very diversified, but you do have some special niches. And I, that's why I was very interested to hear about this new house that you're doing at Crowley House, uh, green, Greenhouse, Growing House for Moms and Anemones. Yeah. You both are affiliated with the Seattle Wholesale Growers Market, yeah. where we are, and your uh, longtime farm members, uh, part of the ownership. Um, so you kind of get, get I, I guess, panic requests from the staff about certain categories that are that there's demand for and then they don't have supply for. Is that sort of what pushed you into doing more mums and, and more enemies? I'm not um, saying that right. but Yeah. Uh, well, well, what partly pushed me into it is that now I have two full-time young ladies that work on the farm and I needed to keep a consistent cash flow throughout the year. So I found that mums pushed us into November right before we start wreath making. And then the wreath making pushed us through December. And then we start into market bouquets. Well, we keep market bouquets going, but that's mainly why we did it. And then the spring crop. Then we start, yeah, anemones are blooming now. So we just, you know, I know it's just, we don't ever stop, but you know, in order to keep monies coming in to be able to pay for somebody, that's, that's why I bumped bumped it up and then also the demand was just huge like uh for moms we could have sold every single and we did I mean, we just cleared the house yeah you did too yeah even with my little starts i gave you yeah <laughs> well and then i dug up mother plants are in their greenhouse i mean i charles was like wake up we have to go get we have to go tag these because we have to dig them because it's going to get cold and i'm <laughs> like you actually you i think he loves them more yeah. Than me now. I mean, I love them. And I was the one always tr- saying, like, let's buy ki- some King's Mom's cuttings, you know, like Back 15 in the day, years right. ago, 20 years ago, when it was King's Mom's. Yeah. <laughs> so the whole King's Mom thing this year has been crazy. I'm just watching it from a distance, you know, listening to people just panicking over that they're not going to get cuttings and who's doing cuttings. And it kind of reminded me of the tulip wars. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I don't know. I'm tulip like, mania or whatever. Those, yeah, are, those are the things going back to the, they come, they circle yeah. back and forth and we see it and we don't panic. We're just like, okay, well, I have my stock. I'm going to use that this year. It's and if you, if you need more cuttings, you call each other and go exactly. take a few and build yeah. your stock. And I have a secret place. I'm going to get a bunch. Ooh. We didn't okay. talk about this. I was too tired to even remember about it. Now <laughs> we're talking about it. I'm like, I have a friend okay. who offered me a whole bunch <laughs> Ooh, new okay, cool. I wanted to just mention also, you both supply product at, in Portland as well, right? Where mm-hmm. can people buy your product in the Portland market? At the Oregon Flower Growers Association. Okay. And Our both- booths are exactly right across from each other, which is kind of fun. Yeah. So is it a different product that you take to or- Portland than you bring here, or is it kind of a complementary? You probably bring the same to both, right? No, nope. I oh. bring, uh, like... I probably send two carts loads up to Portland um, once or twice a week. Um, that's where the majority of my sales are. For uh, Seattle, I think because there's been such an influx of smaller new growers here in Seattle, I just couldn't really compete with what they were growing. You know, with the growing, so I'm more shoulder. So. We'll do spring, but really heavy in the fall and winter because we do a lot of specialty berry and um, evergreens and sticks. And yeah. we have, and again, lots of dried flowers. So, um, yeah, we just try to do a little bit more supplement and then do, you know, we'll send up carts. We'll mm-hmm. listen to people. You know, I talk to Brad and he'll say, like, we really need this, you know, because they get my price list every week and they'll know what they're missing that they know they can sell a ton of up here. So, so it's we'll a, lot of communica- a lot of communication. Yeah. yeah. It's, and same, same with mine. I mean, it's just, it's, it's watching the markets. It's so funny how both markets are so different mm-hmm. and it's like one thing will sell really well in Seattle and Portland. They love it. And Seattle doesn't, you know, so it's just, it's very different. Huh. And so you do find after a while, like I'm not going to send Dusty Miller to the Portland market. I'm going to send no. it up to, you know, to, to, Seattle. Seattle. to Seattle because they it will sell, sell there all day long. Yeah. So and it's just, but they won't buy it in Portland, you know? So you learn those things over time. Um, but we, yeah, so I, I, I definitely vary it. And because we do, we're a farmer floor, so we do a lot of weddings and events year round. I tend to grab onto those shoulder seasons and grow heavy in the spring and the fall because then my summer is not so, 
hectic. You're doing, you're, you're more you're, focused on your own events in yeah. the summer. Wow, mm-hmm. that's awesome. Yeah, I'll call her and I won't get a response. And then she'll call, she'll like text me Sunday. She's like, I'm breaking down our fourth wedding. <laughs> I'm like, <laughs> I remember when I would just do one wedding. I'm like, well. <laughs> <laughs> well, I love it. This is so much fun. We're going to, um, make our way up to the convention center and get ready for I'm teaching. Excited. So, um, yeah, so you've neither, neither of you been to the flower show before? No, no. Awesome. I've always I wanted really, to go. really excited about it. Yeah. But you're both avid plant ne- nerds and plant geeks. So you'll just have fun seeing all of the, all the horticulture, not just the yeah. floriculture. Yeah. Yeah. I'm really looking forward to it. Great. Well, I'm going to take clips of both of you teaching and work the, work it into this video so people can see you in action. All right. <laughs> oh, this is going to be fun. <laughs> I'm, I'm kind of nervous. I'm really excited. I've never. Don't think about it, Bethany. I know. Don't think about it. <laughs> It'll be great. She's going to do great. All right. Thank you both uh-huh. ladies. This Thanks. was really fun. Thank uh-huh. you. Thanks so much for joining us today. There is plenty of bonus material in today's show notes, including video of our interview, as well as clips from both Beth and Bethany's design workshops at the Northwest Flower and Garden Festival. You can learn some easy wreath-making design tips from Bethany and be inspired to create a charming floral crown from Beth. And you can find those videos in our show notes at slowflowerspodcast.com for episode 546. Our next sponsor thanks goes to Mayesh Wholesale Florist. Family owned since 1978, Mayesh is the premier wedding and event supplier in the U.S. And we're thrilled to partner with Mayesh to promote local and domestic flowers, which they source from farms large and small around the U.S. Learn more at mayesh.com. Last week, we sent the February issue of the Slow Flower Summit newsletter out, and you'll want to find it. It's packed with details about lodging options, our sponsors, links to frequently asked questions, details on joining our private Facebook group for attendees, and much more. If you're a member of Slow Flower Society, take advantage of the $50 off registration as a member benefit. We have three incredible flower-filled days planned, and we can't wait for you to join us June 26th through 28th, 2022 in New York. Find more details in today's show notes. I'll share the link to that newsletter or click over to slowflowersummit.com. I hope to see you there. Our final sponsor thanks goes to The Gardener's Workshop, which offers a full curriculum of online education for flower farmers and farmer florists. Online education is more important this year than ever, and you'll want to check out the course offerings at thegardenersworkshop.com. Thanks so much for joining us today. The Slow Flowers Podcast is a member-supported endeavor, downloaded more than 819,000 times by listeners like you. Thank you for listening, commenting, and sharing. It means so much. As our movement gains more supporters and more passionate participants who believe in the importance of our domestic cut flower industry, the momentum is contagious. I know you feel it too. If you're new to our weekly show or our long-running podcast, check out all of our resources at slowflowersociety.com and consider making a donation to sustain Slow Flowers' ongoing advocacy, education, and outreach activities. You can find the donate button in the column to the right at slowflowerspodcast.com. I'm Deborah Prinzing, host and producer of the Slow Flowers Show and the Slow Flowers Podcast. Next week, you're invited to join me in putting more slow flowers on the table, one stem, one vase at a time. The content and opinions expressed here are either mine alone or those of my guests alone, independent of any podcast sponsor or other person, company, or organization. The Slow Flowers Podcast is engineered and edited by Andrew Brenlin. Thank you.